Coming up next on Conversations, Frontline senior producer, Mike Kirk. Frontline is a journalistic narrative. It's a story told by the people in the story. He's a former KCTS 9 documentary producer who left Seattle to join Frontline at its inception. It was fabulous to be inside the invention of something that had as its goal uh, uh, being a serious piece of broadcast journalism at the very time that the networks were all walking away from documentaries. He's since produced more than 200 episodes of the award-winning program, including The Choice, Frontline's acclaimed profile of the presidential candidates. The Choice is a real honor to get to make. Nobody's ever made two, and I'm about to make three. Inside the making of a Frontline episode, the stories, the interviews, and the challenges with Frontline senior producer Mike Kirk, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Mike Kirk, welcome to Conversations. Thank you. It's great to be a here. Actually, uh, I guess it's a welcome back <laughs> because uh, you worked here at KCTS mid 70s? Mid 70s, 1970. Yeah. Into what, about late 70s, early 80s? Early 80s. I went away for a year to a, a journalism fellowship at Harvard called the Neiman Fellowship and came back. And I think I left in 80 or late 80, 81 to start uh, a front line with David Fanning, the executive producer. Actually, you were at the old KCTS at I the was. University of Washington. I was. This is the not-so-new KCTS. Uh, but it's new to me, and yeah. it's wonderful. <laughs> um, you actually are from Idaho. Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho. Right. The University of Idaho Vandal. A vandal. All right. Yeah. yeah, I was across the way there at WSU, so uh, did drive over to Moscow a few times, particularly when the drinking age changed, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about that a great deal here. When did you uh, know that what you wanted to do in life was produce documentaries? I was uh, uh, mowing lawns in Boise, Idaho, and one of my clients was a uh, was the anchor man for the local TV news. And um, I was just talking to him one day in the backyard, and he said, "Why don't you come on down to the station and see if you push a camera instead of a lawnmower?" And I came down and became a cameraman, a part-time at the TV station. And I couldn't believe that they actually paid people to do this. Uh, it was just fascinating. And I got to go along on, a, on an interview once with the governor of Idaho. And uh, I didn't really know any better. And uh, there were three TV stations, and they had their three cameras there. And I asked a really hard question, a harder question than anybody else did. And uh, he kind of blanched and didn't really know what to say. And I saw the, the, his press guy look at me and kind of write my name down and be a little angry. And I thought, if, uh, if you can get paid to make the governor of a state nervous, that's a great job. And uh, since then, I've been making governors <laughs> nervous every day if I can. Governors and senators and other politicians and people uh, deep inside Washington, D.C. and uh, from all walks of life. Yes. Um, you work in public television in, in Idaho? I worked at, yes, I worked at KUID in Moscow, Idaho. It had, uh, it had an audience of about half a herd of cows <laughs> and a full herd of goats and one or two farmers and a lot of college professors. Working here at KCTS, I, I, you know, we went into the vault to find out if we could find Mark <laughs> Kirk stuff. Yeah. And uh, you should know that we're going to make sure that we show the young Mike Kirk with Gee, the thanks. mustache. Thank he you had a mustache much. back there, remember? Yes, I did. You look good. But you, hmm. you did quite a few documentaries here. The great thing that I, that I, I love to do, uh, I didn't know that I would love to do it. I thought I'll, I'd be a news person, probably read the news if I got lucky, because and, and, uh, that seemed to be where the authority and power was. Uh, and I really wanted to change the world. It's sort of why you go into journalism back in those days, especially around the time of Bernstein and Woodward and Deep Throat and the Nixon administration. You were, you were determined to help uh, people and to catch the bad guys, and often the bad guys were in politics. Uh, 
what I discovered when I was in Idaho and then when I came to KCTS was that you could do a lot more with a 30-minute documentary uh, than you could do uh, reading a news story or even making a minute 10 or a two-minute news story. And that's what I was lucky enough to be able to do here. Richie Meyer ran the station at the time. He was an amazing general manager who managed to, to get some money from the community and the university, and uh, I learned uh, how to spend it uh, chasing politicians. You were part of the founding team with Frontline. I was. I was very lucky to, to be there on the ground floor with David Fanning, who's uh, still the executive producer 30 years later, and, uh, and a man named Lewis Wiley, who's very bright, a lawyer, a kind of Mr. Inside. David was, uh, was the brains behind and the charm behind the outfit and had the big vision. And I was there learning and sopping up everything I could and, uh, and, uh, and trying to help as a senior producer. And it was, uh, it was fabulous to be inside the invention of something that had as its goal uh, uh, being a serious piece of broadcast journalism that would run at least an hour long, 26 to 30 times a year, uh, at the very time that the networks were all walking away from documentaries. Uh, we, we thought it was a niche that belonged on public television without commercial interruption, without influence from anybody, and, uh, and to be really serious about it. Uh, there was there wasn't then and there isn't now a lot of really serious television and we were determined to uh, to make it and uh, and uh, much to my surprise especially given how rocky it was at the very beginning here we are 30 years later in hundreds of documentaries and in some ways the only long form documentary series on television uh, that's 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 uh, of its kind of public affairs. There's other kinds of documentaries made, to be sure, but a serious public affairs show uh, that stays on the air for 30 years must be doing something right. With the depth that it brings to the table, yeah, uh, which is pretty incredible. When you say it was rocky there in the beginning, what do you mean? We made the first film we ever made was called uh, "An Unauthorized History of the National Football League of the NFL," and uh, in it we made a couple of fairly serious charges. One was that the Super Bowl with the New York Jets, the Joe Namath Super Bowl, was possibly fixed, that uh, the mob was all over the NFL in those days. It, uh, it ran as our very first broadcast. We had as the anchor a woman named Jessica Savage, who yes. was, the, was an NBC News star and, uh, and a handful. But she herself was determined to change her image, to not be just another pretty face, but to be a serious journalist. And inside Jessica, there beat the heart of somebody who really did want to do the right thing. But she was a handful, right. to be sure. Uh, and we made uh, we made a lot of headlines with that with that program. Our very first time out of the box, we I think it was the highest rated public affairs show on public television, maybe still. Uh, it came out right around the Super Bowl, so it was perfect timing. And uh, and many critics and many others. Uh, including our own board of directors, called us to task for many of the things we did, which we, uh, we, we went just a little too far. We backed up a little bit, and by the next week, we were being lauded again as a, as a, as a great idea that, uh, that uh, went on and on. Sometimes we got it right, sometimes we didn't. We started out saying to ourselves, well, maybe we'll be an anthology, and we'll come up, and we'll have like different shows by different producers and have a kind of different idea and we can afford to be kind of eclectic. Um, but that really wasn't a smart thing to do at the very, very beginning. We, we kind of landed on our feet by the second year and, and, uh, and we've, we've been on the air ever since. Take me through the process of coming up with a topic and then taking that topic and making it a documentary film. The hardest part is trying to is trying to take something that is trying to gauge what people are interested in. What do they really need to know? It's an old cliche in journalism that it's all about the need to know, but it actually is. And one of the ways that I I tell myself when I'm looking for a story, and this is one that matters is is how, I've got to come up with a story and a, and a way of talking about something that people need to know maybe 
they're going to go in the ballot box and vote about it. Maybe they need to make some civic decision. Maybe they need to make some decision vis-a-vis -vis their government or power in some way. So that's the first thing is what kind of a story is it? And I use the word story uh, intentionally. We're very interested in narrative journalism that is a story. I, anybody can sit down in a room. We could sit here now and come up with 26 topics. We've got to do something about the environment. We've got to do something about the automotive industry. We've got to do something about, you know, all of it, abortion and everything. Or, or a better way that evolved for us was thinking about it as a story about an individual or somebody who's doing something that leads to Washington. It starts in Washington, it leads to Washington. Somehow you get inside of, of a narrative that has a character at the heart of it. People love to watch films about characters and about, about people. I made a film that aired the other, other day about um, the economy. The character in that film was obvious. It was Barack Obama, but it was also Tim Geithner. Right. Is Secretary of the Treasury. Where do they grow up and how do they do it? How do they meet each other? Who are they? All the things that you're interested in. And on top of that, you freight it with uh, big, uh, important ideas and problems that face those characters. Once we learned how to do that and once we figured out that that was what it was, uh, then you start to research everything you can find. I have a staff of five who dig, investigators who dig very deeply into everything. I. I basically work all the time and I read everything I can get my hands on about it and so do they. We create a thing called a timeline which is a chronology of everything that happened on that story and everything that we can find that was ever written about it and ever made a television show about it or maybe even a movie about it and they're all put in a big book, every word of it, and then we go out and do when we figure that out then we say okay well there's the story, there's the high points. We go out and we'll do some interviews, we'll do 30, 40 interviews. We'll shoot them for a couple of hours, sometimes three hours long. People aren't used to that. Uh, the people we interview, and I always tell them, you're gonna you're gonna think of things in the middle of this interview that you haven't thought about, even though you've been interviewed ten times on Chris Matthews' show. New things are gonna come out of you because we're gonna talk about them long enough, and I kind of know a lot about it. So we'll go back and forth and go through it, and then we'll edit it for. Uh, so we'll shoot those interviews. We'll get them all together, and we'll edit it for about six or eight or ten or twelve weeks and uh, and then we'll put it on television but here's the thing about that whole process that I've just talked to you about there's a there's an element that exists for us to be able to do that and that is uh, the word time time to research time to think about it time to shoot it time to interview people time to time to edit it time for me to write it uh, it's a six-month idea it's like writing a book every time for a television program that goes up and in 54 minutes it disappears into the ether or goes onto the internet or whatever, it's a very expensive, costly, time-consuming, but uh, a critically important uh, uh, job that we all take very, very seriously. I want to ask you about the production style. There's a couple of different elements here, how you guys shoot it, but and we talked about this a little bit before we got on air here, and that is that when you sit somebody down, you pay great attention to the lighting, but you shoot them very tight, very tight. Yeah. Um, I actually have a camera that's also shooting them a little wider just so that I can cut away. But I think there's probably nothing more interesting uh, when you're talking about something really important than being able as a viewer to look in the eyes of the person who's asserting it, whether it's an elected official that you've trusted with your vote whether it's somebody you don't like or you're trying to decide whether you like, whether it's somebody who runs a corporation, whether it's a bad guy or a victim or whatever, you want to, there's nothing more powerful on television than that face. When you read a book, you can, you know, you can make your judgments based on the characterization of the author but, or the writer, but in television, it's your face, it's my face right now. It's, do you trust me? Do you believe what I'm saying? What do you think about me? It's all revealed uh, in the face. And we work real hard to make sure that everybody, both sides in our stories, or all the sides in our stories, are lit and set up and given the same respectful place on the screen so that, uh, so that you have the opportunity to see them. I think of making these films in just a practical sense as, as uh, having a dinner party. 
So it's like a lot of people around a table, maybe eight or ten, that you watch all through the hour. They come back and you, you like some of them and you know what role they all play and you know kind of what their positions are. And if I tell my story right and I bring those people in and out, just like a great person at a dinner party, I say, Enrique, now, you know, you had a position a little while ago and now you've heard from the other two people over here. Tell me more. How, what's the next thing I need to know about that? That's sort of the way the, 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 the that's the armature of the documentary. That's how it unfolds. But it's all based really on those people and what they think and what they're saying. It's not so much fancy camera tricks for other things we do, although we care a lot about setting scenes up and all of that, and I care a lot about how I write ways in and out of things. But it's really the 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 interviews with those people that tells and carries our stories. Yeah, I'm always amazed how you get these people to open up. And maybe it's the fact that you spend so much time with them with the t tight shot and, and interviewing them and trying to get every angle out. It, it, it helps, it, and it helps to do, it helps to just sit there and talk to them. There, there's so many people when they get interviewed, in the first place, we have, to, we have to confess something. There's nothing better for somebody's ego than to be a rapt listener to them, right? right? They're talking. They've worked hard at something, they know something, they have a piece of knowledge, they've run for office, they want to tell their story, whatever it is. If they've been willing to come and sit in a chair with a camera and all the technology around them, then they have something they want to talk about. My job then is to guide them along through that process so that they get, we, we get the maximum of what they know. I always say to people, I'm, when I'm done with you, I like to think of what I'm doing as I'm making a commercial with you. I'm selling your idea the best way I can. That means I know as much about it as you do. That means I help you through it. That means I'm on your side all the way along. I'm not here to be adversarial with you. If you say something that doesn't comport or doesn't seem right or doesn't, doesn't seem true, whatever truth is, I may challenge you on it. But that's just to help you get your position out there. Now, what you need to know is tomorrow I'm interviewing a person on the other side and I'm going to say this exact same thing to them. And I'm, my job, I see, is, is to try to get their side of it out, too, and then lay it out and let the, uh, and let the public make a decision as fairly uh, as I can. And I also make one other promise to everybody, especially people who don't want to do it. I made this promise to only one person who ever really took me up on it. I'll tell you who that is in a minute. The promise is... Uh, I'll come watch this at your house when it's on television, if you want, or your office, wherever you want. You want to punch me in the nose? That's your moment. It's a promise. I'll come over to you, and, I've, and I mean it. I really will. Nobody's ever taken me up on it except one person, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. <laughs> <laughs> and he really did want me to come and see it. As it was, I couldn't. Yeah. So we did it on the phone on a conference call, oh. and I could hear him howling and yelling at the screen and all that stuff. Uh, but I would have, if, I, if there was any way possible, I would have loved to be there for that moment. It would have been a better <laughs> punchline for this story. To, to I know. make a promise to. <laughs> Something that happens every four years. You've done it how many times now? I did uh, Bush Gore, and I did Obama uh, McCain. McCain. And now you're in the midst of it. And now I'm in the midst of just having finished this Wall Street uh, money power in Wall Street. Uh, I've been sort of doing double duty. I've been editing uh, Wall Street and reading and getting ready for the Obama, now uh, Romney, um, and we're presuming it's Romney, uh, uh, campaigns and stories. The choice is a real honor to get to make. Nobody's ever made two, and I'm about to make three, the third one. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a challenge and a burden all at the same time, partly because uh, the, uh, the idea is it's a biography of the two candidates that runs a lot in October in the United States and around the world, but it does not involve an interview with either candidate. The, the rules are no interview with that candidate. So it's really character, uh, who they are, what they've done, and, and, and what it is about them that will make them uh, a good president a president for the people now, who want whatever the people now want. So I have to kind of guess, what do people want? What is it about the characters, all the things that have happened to Barack Obama and uh, Mitt Romney that I can line up and weave together so that you and your viewers can watch it and make 
at that moment, in October sometime, a decision about who they're going to vote for. Uh, and it's not about necessarily about issues. It's not about their stand on different policies, although it's about those things. It's really, I'm going for character in their life narrative. Um, if, if you, like me, believe that there are six or seven moments in anybody's life that really matter, where who you are or what you're turning out to be is challenged, tested, and you've made a decision. Uh, I spend an unbelievably inordinate amount of my time uh, today walking around in Seattle trying to think about moments in Barack Obama's life. Mm -hmm. What are they? What mattered? How important was that? Especially now that he's president. I mean, one of the candidates, one of the people in this film is a sitting president, an incumbent president. And that's so, got to be different because it, when you did Bush Gore, they were running for the office. Right. Same thing with McCain and Obama. Right. But now he's been in office. For now years. he's been in office and he has a record yeah. that you can uh, test. And I've made three films about, about that. So about the things that he's done as president, I've been following him very closely, been in and out of the White House, been in and I've talked to most of the people who've worked with him, almost all the people who've reported on him. Uh, I, have a, I have my own sense of who Barack Obama is. Um, and, and so you might think, well, he's going to do, parts of the film are going to be about health care, parts of the film are going to be about the financial crisis, parts of the film are going to be about other things that he's dealt with, the, the war president, the guy who got uh, bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, yeah. maybe that guy he is. I know a lot about his militaristic side, uh, sh a shocking and surprising other side of Barack Obama. Uh, but maybe there's parts of who he is and who he was that I did in my last biography that I've seen revealed in what he's been doing. And maybe that's what I want to emphasize. I, I haven't decided yet, and some of it will be informed by getting to know Mitt Romney and, uh, and all, of the, all of the ways that he is and the influences and the things that have influenced him and trying to line those two up side by side and test Obama's record and Romney's record but also get to know who the characters are. Endlessly fascinating, and as I say, a real honor and privilege to do it. How do you get around the spin? I mean, you're going to be talking to the people that know them, maybe know them the best. Yeah. Um, don't know if you'll get the wives or if you even we want the do. wives. We usually do. But how do you get around the spin? Uh, it's not easy. Uh, these people are, this is what they do for a living. All the people around a president and around a candidate, they're spinners. They're really good at it. Um, what you try to do is you try to know as honestly as possible from people and things you've read and things you've seen and your own gut uh, what you're after before you actually start interviewing people so that when you're being spun, you know you're being spun. I mean, half the battle against spinners is to know they're spinning you at that moment. And the good ones are really good at it. Uh, and skipping a lot of the people who you know will spin. I mean, why even interview them if, uh, if uh, you're going to do that? Um, it's the, cha the great challenge is to cut through all the chaff, all the stuff that comes flying at you, both as a journalist and as a citizen, about these two men and try to get to the essential qualities. And if we're successful, then that's why the choice. When the choice has been successful as a television two-hour documentary, it is when it has found those moments that uh, where, you're, where you suddenly know something and you as a producer know it and whoever you interview and whatever you're doing is really helping you get to that finish line. Uh, there were many people who, who tried to sell us on different versions of who Al Gore was and different versions of who George W. Bush was, both bad and good. And uh, the challenge was to get right through to the essential truth about about each each man and try to then build the film around that. And that's what I'm doing. That's the process I'm in right now, which is an interior process to me uh, and, and the producers I work with, uh, to try to sort out who is, Mitt, who is the real Mitt Romney or the Mitt Romneys and who is the real Barack Obama or the Barack Obamas, because there are many, uh, there are multitudes in each of us and especially them. A couple of minutes left here. This job that you have, it's in, this, in essence, you know, you're really doing political documentaries for the most part, but uh, you're also getting at the heart of people and uh, the American way of life and 
uh, even beyond that because some of these are international. But it seems to me that for you, it's all consuming. Yes. Yeah. It really is. It is the greatest, I mean, it's beyond a job. It's the greatest calling, whatever you want to call it. There's not a real phrase for it. I've never been able to identify what it is. But it, it consumes me in a, in a way that is uh, completely edifying. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. I never forget that I have a tremendous responsibility as I do it. Uh, it never feels like work. It's hard, but it never really, it never really is something that I regret doing. Um, I, I live very well because of it, and, uh, and I'm uh, you know, it, it endlessly grateful and, and glad that I get to do it because it is, as you say, it's, it's all-consuming in a, in, a, in a way that you, know, you couldn't do if it wasn't about something so important. I mean, the presidency of the United States, health care, I made a film last year on top secret America that was all of the billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of secret things that have been built since 9-11. Uh, to the privilege to learn all of that, to have that in your head, to know about it, to be able to sit and just talk to someone and have it come out is, a, is astonishing even to me that it's me that's doing it. But I, uh, but I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't have it any other way. Hey, it beats mowing lawns. <laughs> Well, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Kirk, hey, thank you very much. Um, everybody at KCTS, of course, is proud of the fact that uh, you had a little time here. I love it. And uh, look forward to seeing more of your work. It's great stuff. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.